Welcome to the Matt Hastings Podcast. Today's guest is Nick Patel. Nick is a friend, a Compass colleague, and one of our Rockstar team members. Originally from Virginia, Nick has been living and breathing real estate his entire life. He made his way here to North Texas about a decade ago and has become totally immersed in the community, especially when it comes to real estate investing. Today we're going to talk about Nick's journey, living in North Texas, and some of his insights for the 2023 real estate market. Like, you have a cool story. Is it cool? I think so. <laughs> yeah. And you grew up in Virginia. Yeah. In hotels. Yeah, motels. Motels. Yeah, it's a difference. Well, there is a difference. <laughs> They're very right. Yeah, we live off the side of the highway. But you effectively have, done, have been living and breathing real estate your whole life, if you think about it that way. I do think about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So take us back to the beginning. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, you know, my parents immigrated from England. Uh, we originally, they bought a motel, roadside motel in Ohio. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It had a bar, a restaurant. It was on a marina. So my mom managed the restaurant and bar uh -huh. and my dad managed the motel. Yeah. Straight from England. Wow. Uh, yeah. And they found it very difficult because obviously I was like three years old, I think. Mm-hmm. And they have 24-7-ish jobs when you're yeah, running a motel. Yeah, 24-7 jobs. So they sold that after about a year. Uh-huh. And they hit the road, and we ended up in Virginia. Yeah, off the highway. That's, that's, they just looked, just found another motel. Yeah, they were just basically any people were just driving around the, the country and popping in motels, and uh, I think it was a seller finance deal. Uh huh. So you know they didn't have much money or any money, I don't think. So yeah, yeah. So the guy financed it, and uh, and then you guys moved in, and we moved in. <laughs> yeah, we moved in right away. So yeah, and the funny part about it is not funny part, but they didn't rent to black people. Out before my parents. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it was a small town in Virginia. Moonshine capital of the world, actually. Interesting. It's on the billboard. As you, <laughs> on the as welcome you roll billboard. Through, yeah. Welcome to the moonshine capital of the world. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got a claim to fame, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's pretty arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah, so the small town then. Small town, yeah. One high school, just 2,000 uh -huh. people in my high school, I think, over 2,000 people. Well, that's actually pretty good. I mean. I, I, my high school was like four or 500. So now it sounds like you're from a metropolis compared to a big to, county. I think uh, we have, okay, like, have people commuting in. Yeah. The I mean, some people rode on the bus for an hour or two before they got to school so. <laughs> in the uh, snow, both ways. Yeah, yeah. That sounds crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was a rural area, six dairy Queens. It, wow. In the same town or in, in the, same the county? Town, in the county. Okay. Same family and six dairy Queens. So they was, were like big time. Mm hmm. It was an extended and then your parents awesome. started with one hotel, but didn't they kind of add to their portfolio over the years? Yeah, I think in back in the late '80s, early '90s. Uh -huh. Well, my dad bought a couple properties, motels. Yeah, um, one was in a college town, the college I ended up going to, yeah. Radford. Um, yeah, and then in the early '90s, started developing. Okay, buying into franchises. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, franchise is a nice model for people in that business. Yeah, I can. I think that's kind of the only place to kind of expand beyond just buying a bu bunch of motels on the side of the highway. You know, labor yeah. is an issue, right? Yeah, and like, I guess like now there's the thing about boutique hotels, but that's still like a whole different animal too. That's almost for like an artist more so, I think, than a. Yeah, you know, the things it's kind of come full circle. People, you know, they like the motel vibe or the small town, you know, mm -hmm. small hotel, right? Like boutique firm. Well, it used to be. I remember growing up that you we could go on a long road trip and then be like, hey, let's just stop at this motel and get a room. But like, this is in the 80s, early 90s probably. Now it's like, you can't do that. Like you have to have reservations on your road trip yes, to get a hotel sure. room, which I find to be so crazy. On our family trips, our trips were planned based on whose motel uh, was on the way. Like and who they knew. Relationships. Relationships, okay. yeah. So we, you know, growing up. get the up, friends and family rate that way. Yes, exactly. And okay. you get to see people. Right. So did you guys tr do a lot of road trips? Then? Yeah, we did. We did. Favorite favorite road trip you can recall? Uh, I think I want to say we went to Toronto. Oh, wow. And to Niagara Falls. Okay. That was pretty good. Yeah. In a, in a, in a what are those vans called? I call it a minivan? No, not a minivan, but, uh, you know, the ones that had the blinds and all those, those conversion vans. Oh, the, okay. That you can like, sleep in. Well, they were big, right? They kind of had the, you know, they were bigger than your standard van. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we went to Toronto and Niagara Falls and one of those uh -huh. things. Okay. With another family. 
All right. Yeah. All in the same conversion van or in separate vans? All in the same conversion van. Okay, yeah, one man. big happy tour bus. Yes, with the blinds rattling the whole time <laughs> for hours and hours. <laughs> the end. things you remember, right? Yeah. So That's pretty funny. Yeah, so you got immersed in real estate young. When you think about it, people don't think about hotels as real estate. Well, yeah. Number one, but I, I, hotels are like a rental building that you can raise the rate on every month. Yeah, I mean, they'll have a, you know, they're income generating uh, piece of real estate. Yeah. So, so that's like kind of a different niche in the whole real estate world. I think all of us, when we think of hotels, we immediately think of our favorite vacation. Uh, less so than like, oh, this is a pretty cool piece of real estate I could own. Yeah, I think so for my, my, my parents and a lot of people that I know, they went from you know, these roadside motels to building franchises mm -hmm. on the side of interstates and highways yeah. and then moving into the more uh, urban areas. Right. It's like almost cities, like airports. Monopoly. Yeah. Right? You're just trying to keep trading up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what inspired you after like living in motels or living around real estate to then get in the business yourself? Uh, it was just kind of natural progression. I always wanted to work in real estate or the yeah. hotel business because that's kind of all I knew yeah. at a certain point. Um, yeah, and things changed. Things changed. So I just wanted to kind of start over. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought residential would be a good spot. And so that's that. about the time you came to Dallas? Exactly. Actually, and actually, I moved to Dallas back in 2011. Okay, so you've been here 12 years now. Yeah. And so in 2017 is when I started to just kind of immerse myself in mm -hmm. all things real estate. And what were your, when you got in, what kind of surprised you? Um, you know, it's learning, right? You, I started flipping homes. And I thought it was be, I thought it would be like HGTV. Yeah. Far from it. <laughs> I think uh, the first year bought like six deals. Uh huh. That's and one every other month. I think that's good. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I was very profitable. I think they all lost money. Uh, a couple of them rebroke <laughs> okay. even. I do think this is the myth that everybody has when they're like, "I'm going to invest in real estate." I just want to clarify when people say invest because sometimes they mean sometimes people mean flip. Yeah, and and that's kind of like investing, but it's in many ways like an operational business. Like you got to have your processes down, and you're really not holding onto the asset that long like a traditional investor. So. Yeah, it sounds like you learned a lot. Yeah, I learned year. a lot. I learned that I needed to do a better job sourcing deals. Okay. Because I was buying properties through a third party, mm -hmm. like a wholesaler. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, I've realized that they were making more money on the wholesale side of things than I was on the flips. And you have all this capital in the and deal. I have all, and I take all, and the, all the risk. Yeah. I do think a person can make money on flips. Oh, I know people to do it, like, you know. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there. I do think it's for somebody who really has all their systems dialed in mm -hmm. and relationships. Yeah, you have to have crews ready to go, right? Yeah. And depending on the price point of the homes, um, you know, that crew could look very different from yeah. place to place. So. Yeah, I mean, I I see it every now and then, the high-end flips. Of course, yeah. there's just a lot more margin overall in that. But you also have a really particular buyer, and if your crew's not good, yeah. they're not going to buy that house. Right, you don't want to build a grade. <laughs> finishes in, on a, in a two million or three million dollar house. Dollar house. Yeah. yeah. So that's a problem. So you kind of, you, you started in flipping and I, I think you occasionally do a flip here and there still. Is that yes. correct? Yes. What advice would you give to somebody who says, I want to, I want to be a flipper? Uh, I would say do your research first. Okay. What and does that look like? Finding crews, talking to folks that work in like vendors, you know, subcontractors, mm -hmm. materials, um, the finish out, the design aspect, I would almost suggest partnering with somebody initially just to kind of learn. Yeah, get the uh, relationship because you're unlikely to have the relationships before you get in that business. Otherwise, you know, buy a property low enough where you can just bring on a general contractor to do everything mm -hmm. for you, right, if you don't have expertise in that space. But do those deals even exist right now where you can get that good of a deal? Uh, investors are kind of a holding pattern right now. I think Natalia and I were talking about it earlier uh -huh. uh, that she's – seeing homes that are not fixed up, right? Updated or renovated yeah. to go on the market recently. And I said, what I've seen is investors kind of in a holding spot because they don't know where the market's going to go. So if they buy a property today, is it still going to have the same value three months from now? Yeah. So the home that, you know, was built in the nineties and is frozen in time yeah. in the nineties, normally an investor would snatch that up if it's got a good floor plan and they could, you know, 
turn it around maybe a couple of months absolutely and resell it but now people i think are not sure where prices are going exactly i think they're gonna be flat but even still for an investor that poses some challenge yeah i mean you know on the retail side we're seeing this is not enough inventory and yeah that's why we're seeing multiple offer situations on the good houses on the good houses yeah if it's priced um, correctly yeah on the on these ones that are frozen in time <laughs> yeah. unless they have a unique feature it's gonna probably sit a while mm-hmm is Compass still even doing concierge now? Yeah, Compass has concierge still. The, the program kind of changes in all these yeah. evolutions. I've yet to have a client <laughs> want to do it. I mean, I've had clients that make investments in their properties, but a lot of times they just have the plenty of capital and then they do it on their own. Mm-hmm. But it is kind of a slick, slick idea for a person who doesn't want to put their own money into upgrading their house. Yeah, but they're, it's being taken out at closing. Yeah, right. it's not free money. It's We're not, not just, money. <laughs> just handing out money, but it's it's there's no there's no financing cost though. Yeah. So I mean, it's better than home equity loan. Interest free. Yeah, exactly. Okay. To my knowledge, there's no. I know there's for sure no interest, but I don't think there's any financing fees either. So just it's not a third party. It's straight through Compass. They have a partner that manages the program. Okay. Through them, but yeah, if they sign a listing agreement with Compass and they have equity in their property, then they're mm-hmm. more than likely able to use concierge. Is that the only two qualifiers? I, I don't know for sure. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, there may be some other ones, but high level, if, if they fit in that bucket, then it's worth talking to them about it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's great for clients who want to sell and need a little bit of work. Yeah. If they need a lot of work, then that's maybe like a whole different story. But so who, again, if they need a lot of work, maybe they should settle for a slightly lower price to get the home sold and somebody else who has that expertise can come in and maybe take it to another level. So they have a contractor come in? Do you know? Who's they? Meaning comp- Compass Concierge. No, it's who more drives? or less like a blank check for the um, homeowner. Oh, I see. Yeah, so the program is cool. I mean, I shouldn't say blank check, but mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of times the agent will have the relationships and they'll help them. I see. To me, the biggest uses of concierge are like storage for all your extra stuff, like paying for that. Sometimes people will even use, use it for short-term housing. So they're like, get out of their house. And then, or maybe even for staging and then like paints and other things. Mm-hmm. Like major renovation, I don't think the capital is there for that. But for smaller things like fixing up a bathroom or a kitchen, I think the money's there for those kind of projects. Are you a real estate agent listening to this podcast? Our team is growing. To find out more about joining a fun, service-minded team, go to hastingsre.com slash careers. That's H-A-I-S-T-I-N-G-S-R-E dot com slash careers. So yeah, I digress a little bit, but thinking about ways of investing, we talk about, sure, a person could come in and they want to flip Mm -hmm. and and advice for that. Now you have a wholesale company. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how that works? Yeah, we buy homes for cash. Actually, we buy homes uh, several different ways, but cash is one of them. Uh-huh. Uh, again, I think you know why people, why some folks uh, prefer wholesaling uh, over selling a home traditionally with a realtor is you're trading in time and convenience for yeah. for money. So obviously, it has to make sense for both parties. Yeah. Now, most of your people that are doing this, would you call them a distressed house or a distressed seller? I would. Motivated is the word. Motivated. To be more quick, yeah. <laughs> so they're a motivated seller. And um, yeah, you're able to come in and close relatively quickly on something Yeah, we like that. You know, can close based on what the what the sellers prefer, right? If they uh-huh. want if they need to find another place. Um, you know, we can work with the with the sellers to close whenever you know works best for them. Yeah. And so your end client there, is it typically another investor? Typically, yeah, yeah. Or is it somebody who may would it be appropriate for like a first time investor to buy from a wholesaler? Potentially. To just I guess depending on their depending, goals, right? yeah. Depending on, you know, the condition of the property. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some properties out there that don't need a lot of work and people kind of just some investors just throw them back on uh, MLS uh-huh. with the realtor. Yeah. So that's just, uh, you know, those properties are considered wholetailing. Wholetailing. Okay. Yeah. So just moving it, just providing the ease of the transaction. Yeah. Basically, you know, the investor would buy the property and turn around and put it back on the MLS. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like open door. <laughs> yeah. Without actually doing any work. Right. Yeah. So it's limited. Well, work. they don't do any work either. Work. Yeah. So. <laughs> I love to rag on open door though. So yeah. <laughs> I could spend, a, spend a couple hours on that. But um, so wholetailing, interesting. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then the other avenue for a person who's investing would be something along the lines of buy and hold. Buy right? and hold, yeah, rental properties. Yeah. A lot of people are. Which is like, we talked about hotels, but mm-hmm. it's probably single family home or duplexes. Yeah, so when investors look at a property, they want to be able to potentially refinance cash out for everything they have in the property. So mm-hmm. if they purchase that, say, on a $100,000 house, for $70,000, right, you put $10,000 into it, you can technically cash out for your everything that oh, you have money. into the property. Yeah. So. That's what's so cool to me about real estate is all the leverage that exists. Absolutely, yeah. Now, I think just even a regular retail buyer doesn't appreciate leverage. Like they're thinking about it from the emotional, I'm buying my home. But when that home that they bought for 500000 and put 5% down goes up 10%, mm-hmm. it's not... It's, it's way more than 10%. It's like 10X or 5X on their 5% they put into it. Yeah, and you can continue to uh, leverage that money and pull money out of there, yeah, right? Which, Tax-free. Yeah, which people don't even think about it, but they do it all the time with like their home equity loans mm-hmm. or home equity line of credit or just a regular cash out refinance. Yeah. And you can claim depreciation as well. So right. it'll yeah. offset some of the income yeah, if you rent the property. Yeah, I have a lot of investments, or excuse me, a lot of investors who have reached out in the last couple of months as the market changed, mm-hmm. I think, well, a lot of my investor clients were kind of on, on hold last year because I'm like, this is insane. Like, I don't feel good about you trying to get a buy and hold type property in this environment. You have to pay so much mm-hmm. over the asking price. And now as the market shifted, I'm seeing a lot of opportunities, but a lot of people kind of come back in in the buy and hold space. Uh, during, recess, during recessionary times, you know, it's a good time to buy. Generally, historically, it's been a good time to buy rental properties. Yeah. To kind of offset that. Well, so. Probably about there now. Yeah. Um, were you back in, the, in, in, in doing real estate investing in like the housing crisis back then? No. No? I was in the hotel space back okay. then. Yeah. I, I, think, I think a lot of wealth was created. <laughs> Back then. Yeah. I mean, a lot of wealth may have been lost, but a lot of wealth was also created for people that came in and bought patiently during that time. It was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we're going to see that again this time around. Uh, there's no signs leading to that. Yeah. Right? There's, you know, obviously there's a lot of rules and regulations in place since that happened. Yeah. So. You can't just get money for nothing and have to actually have a job and credit yeah. and all that now. So. Yeah, they're just not yeah. writing checks out there now. So Yeah, I, I think, like I said, I think we're just going to be flat this year. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts for like an investor in 2023 that they should think about? I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity, especially in the rental market, you know, buying holds. I don't know yeah. about flips. Um, it just depends, you know. I think where we're seeing most... Um, the change is on higher end homes, right? Just like with flips, just like on the retail side, mm-hmm. right? I think people are staying away from those risky, softer, end, yeah, way softer, right? So they're looking for more sure bets, mm-hmm. sure wins, right? Yeah, compared to a long shot. So you know, I think people are kind of re- hitting the reset button on the investor side as well. Yeah, I guess one of the things I've learned is that for anybody, the closer they are to the median price point. One, there's more competition because everything yeah. is clustered there. But two, like there's just a lot more opportunity for an investor. It's safer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, a rising tide lifts all boats. So yeah. if the market keeps going up and if it kind of yeah slowly does this goes up, it's yeah, a think, long-term thing. Yeah, I think we're in a good spot right now. Yeah. It's just, uh, so, just rates have a lot to do with it. Obviously, the cost of borrowing money yeah. uh, has gone up quite a bit. And it's got to, it's got to make sense. So mm-hmm. with the market well, shift. So how do you know if it makes sense? What, what are kind of criteria that you would use when you're like, oh, this is, this is a deal that makes sense? Thinking uh, about it from a retail investor perspective first. I would say, does it cash flow? Yeah. Right? And do I have the ability to pull out everything that I have into the property? So, you know, I always kind of break investments or investors into two pockets, right? Two groups, mm-hmm. the passive and the active investor, right? The passive yeah. comes with 20% down. Once to once to buy a house that you know doesn't really maybe not cash flow as much, they're looking at it as a, from an appreciation standpoint. Mm-hmm. Ten years from now, what's ten years yeah, it might be worth you know hundred thousand dollars more, right? And mm-hmm. somebody else is paying their mortgage for them. Where an active investor may look for cash flow, yeah, and, and appreciation, mm-hmm. right? So I mean, for myself, I'd like to look look for homes in hyper appreciation and hyper appreciation markets, right, or neighborhoods specifically, Collin County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Denton County. No. Yeah. So I think we're at a good spot for maybe not hyper appreciation, but appreciation. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
And we'll then you're saying like, uh, there's maybe some value add options there too. Yeah. What's the value add there? Investor. Yeah. Putting, you know, making upgrades and that sort of thing. And yeah. cash flow does a cash flow. Mm-hmm. So some people look for cash flow. More and mailbox than money. Every month you get those checks mm-hmm. for. When I first joined the business, I we met my friend actually who was doing. He had a client. And I think they had a portfolio of like 20, 25 properties. So it was a nice size portfolio. And they just kind of started selling them off. Like their kids weren't interested in managing them. He'd had a successful career as a lawyer. And they every they just pick up properties without yeah. opportunity. And now they have this multi-million dollar real estate portfolio that they were just slowly selling off as cash flow. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, cash flow now taking their cash out of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's pretty cool to think about. I mean, just a house here and there every other year, and now they're in their 60s, 70s, and they've got this huge oh yeah m- multi-million dollar mm-hmm. portfolio that's largely paid for itself. It's like a retirement account. Exactly. So. Or, I mean, they could have just taken the, every year, most of the properties have been paid off at this point. So every year they're getting a nice income just from that. That, and I'm sure they could cash out refi. Yeah. Right? At the same time, Have you ever anybody money? do a 1031 exchange? Yes. Talk about that. What, what is a 1031 exchange? It's a way to about? defer taxes by yeah. investing in a similar or like product. I mean, like property. Yeah. So say, for instance, you have a rental property and you want to sell it and you want to upgrade to something bigger, you can use that and defer taxes. Mm-hmm. And right. Forever. Forever. You can, yeah. you can continue to do that over and over. It's like the monopoly. You take your houses, you mm-hmm. trade it to a hotel. You take your hotels, you trade it to a multifamily or office building or and just then, buy more yeah, and, and then just keep going. Cash out refinance, right? You're getting, pulling out money tax free. Yeah. So. And then you die and everything you gets to a stepped up basis and <laughs> so there's no taxes on that either. Right? Yeah. Inheritance tax. Yeah. So in, in the investor, well, just in real estate in general, but I imagine, especially like in wholesaling and in the investor world, you've seen some weird or, or unusual deals. Like, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I've been in hoarder houses. I've been <laughs> in houses that had no electricity. Uh-huh. People were still living in there. Like they just weren't paying their bills. And yeah, I, we recently purchased a property where the gentleman inherited the home and he was living there with his dogs without electricity for months on end. What? I think nine months. Yeah. And so you could maybe get away with that in like September, October, November. I think. Yeah, it's pretty. The weather's pretty great, but I mean, I mean imagine dogs. It's not just, so good. Yeah. yeah, no air moving around. No, no air. No, yeah, it was scary. No heating and cooling. It was scary. No outside lights at night. Yeah. <laughs> so. And from the outside, you wouldn't. You could never tell. Of right? course. People were people were actually even living in yeah. there. Or the place was dilapidated. Wow. Yeah, I've been in a lot of hoarder houses. Uh, so, like, what does that really look like in real? Is it as bad as a TV show? Yeah, actually, I. We was going to buy a house from this attorney, and she was a hoarder. <laughs> uh-huh. She had her mom and dad passed away and brought all the all their belongings into uh-huh. her home, and basically Just was get a, rid of them. Yeah, sentimental value, of course. But there was a path from the front door to the to the uh, living room where they had like a super <laughs> like a sectional, uh-huh. and then a path to the kitchen. That was it. That's the only place you could walk. Oh my gosh! I used to see a house like this one time, and it was on MLS. And there were no interior photos. So it's always it's always like oh, a red yeah. flag when yeah. you're like, this is a great deal. You're like, well, <laughs> we have to see the entire Yeah. And it was just like that. And it was like shoulder height, like just things stacked up. And I was in disbelief. Because, you know, I seen it on TV, but I oh, figured yeah. it was really embellished. But it was like, same thing. Like just like some main paths, like bathroom to bedroom to kitchen. And it's just it's a sickness. stuff. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy. Yeah. So I've seen I some scary places. Yeah. What about fun, fun deals? Uh, fun deals. And they're all fun. <laughs> they're all fun. That's they're all true. fun in their own That's way. That's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you've, you've, you've seen it all as well. Yeah. I can well, tell you about bad deals. <laughs> Those are more entertaining. Yeah. Let's, let's hear it with no names. Just because we can learn <laughs> some lessons from these stories. Yeah. The latest one was our, you know, our friend, our clients, uh-huh. right? That backed out. Oh, of the, the on the day before closing? Yeah. And so, lost $40,000. Lost $40,000. I tried builder, so hard to tell him that wasn't a good idea. The builder was able <laughs> to sell the home the very next day. Yeah. Or maybe even possibly the same day. For yeah. the same amount of money. Yeah. So, but I think this speaks to a lesson right now for all buyers is there's so much uncertainty and some people just really have a hard time with uncertainty. 
and just have won't don't really want to go forward. Yeah. I get and of course it. with the builder, it's so so long before the home gets delivered. But I think people were spoiled by the low interest rates, right? Thinking yeah, that it was going to last forever. Well, people but, that are under thirty are like, when are interest rates coming back to normal? And you're like, they are normal. Yeah, and they're, they're <laughs> yeah, their understanding of normal interest rate is three percent, three four percent. So I mean, inflation is less than that. Yes. So I don't foresee us getting back to that. Yeah, we're at nine ten percent inflation right now, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, Anyways, so lesson learned. Lesson learned. Listen to your realtor. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you hire a good one. <laughs> True. There are plenty of good ones out there. Um, yeah, that was, that was unfortunate. It kind of hurt my heart, but I'm never one to like try to, I, you know, present the options and people choose what they want to do. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's their decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I like, I like to have a guided approach, but yeah, some people just don't listen. True. This might not be a good fit for us as clients. Well, I certainly like to educate people. So you've been here longer than I realized. You said since 2011. Mm -hmm. So 12 years. 12 years. And you come across to me as somebody that's about town, like having fun, meeting people. What are your favorite hangouts, favorite spots to go to? I like to go to Addison. We've lived in Addison for quite a while. Uh huh. Addison's you know, ever-changing, ever-evolving. Yeah. Um, a good restaurant scene. Good restaurant scene. I go to Sherlock's a lot over there. I don't know that I've ever been there. I know where it is. Yeah, in the plaza there, right? Uh huh. Anyways, but yeah, <laughs> it's pretty low key. Okay, Sherlock's. Sherlock's is a place that I go to. Um, See, I think you go to a variety of places too. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'm a I'm older, so. <laughs> Does that mean I'm old get, too? I get stuck <laughs> in the same spot, right? I go to the same spots yeah. again and again. Well, what would be your go-tos then? I don't know if I have any go-to spots. I just go where it's kind of convenient. Addison is one of those places. Okay. Right? So you get a little bit of everything over there. Well, that's funny because I, you live in West Plano. I live in West Plano. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to drive that far south unless I'm already there. I want it's to like stay five in minutes my, away. I know. I stay in my West Plano <laughs> bubble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's a lot of spots in West Plano. That's why I feel like I have to go to Addison. Oh, interesting. Like, we used to go to Whiskey Cake a lot. I haven't been there in a long time, but I like Whiskey Cake. They got a great happy hour. Yeah? Um, I've never been to 60 Vines, their little sister it's restaurant. It's funny, I've been to 60 Vines, but not the one in Plano. I've been to the one downtown. I didn't know they had one downtown. Yeah, it's over by... Um, it's going to take me too long to remember, but it's in a nicer part of downtown. I think yeah. over by the Pearl. Yeah, I don't hang out too much. We go to the Katie Ice Trail. Katie Ice. What is it? Katie Ice House? Right uh, Outpost in Plano Outpost, on Outpost. Park Boulevard. Yeah. yeah. It's a great place for people with dogs. Like me. Yeah. I like, yeah. When the weather's great, I like to go there. Um, but, you know, I usually pick the wrong time because I'll be like, oh, I'm not too busy on this Sunday afternoon. Let's go with the dog over <laughs> to Katie Trail Ice. I'm like, oh, it's a Cowboys game. It's totally packed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, in the evening, I mean, that's what I love about North Texas is the weather is good most of the year for like outdoor places like that. Yeah, I think we have like one month that's bad weather, February. Yeah. Generally, historically, yeah. right? Seems yeah. To be so February is some, sometimes rough. We've had a, like an ice storm almost every year in February. Yeah. So, yeah, I like to try different restaurants. The newest one, Portillo's. I know, I haven't been there yet. Yeah. What, what was your initial thinking on it? Uh, it was good. It was it was worth the hour and a half wait. I think <laughs> an hour and a half wait. Yeah, isn't but it like hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff? Hot dogs, hamburgers, and Italian beef sandwiches. Hmm. With the jardinera. Wow. Yeah. So it's pretty good. It was pretty good. Huh. An hour and a half wait. Though. Hour and a half wait. Yeah, man. There's probably a line around the building the Saturday when I was in there. Oh, uh, weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So. Holy I wouldn't, cow. Yeah, I wouldn't do that, but. Yeah, have you been to the dog house in Richardson? I have been to the dog house. When I, say, I don't know, I think of hot dogs. I it's think it's gourmet dog dogs. House. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I like a standard dog. Oh, a mustard dog. That's <laughs> just, it. Just a regular <laughs> hot dog. Yeah, regular hot dog. I guess the only time I have a hot dog is when I go to the dog house. Though. You drive all the way to Richardson for um, a hot dog. If I, and, you know, sometimes as an agent, you're out and about in random places and. Richardson's yeah. got some good but I'll restaurants. I'll go there like on holidays where I feel like I'm supposed to have a hot dog. Like on Memorial Day weekend, I'll be like, it's a good weekend for a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> or if I'm in town for 4th of July weekend, July, I'll be yeah. like, oh, I should have a hot dog this weekend. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of yeah. weird thinking, but it's the yeah. truth. Yeah, Richardson's got a pretty good food scene, I would say. Yeah. How about yourself? My favorite spots? Yeah. Well, like I said, I kind of keep to my Austin Ranch bubble. 
Yeah, I mean, I like the shacks over there because I can take the dog. Yeah. In fact, this weekend, it was so nice. I went on Saturday evening and sat out on the patio at the shacks and um, with the dog and yeah. had, a, had a burrito, and that's a cool spot. Oh, my uh, God, tacos? Is that what it's called? Yeah, OMG Tacos. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good spot. Um, I like, I, for the longest time, I have gone to Whistle Bridges in Plano. Whistle Bridges, okay. Yeah, I used to be obsessed with Whistle Bridges. I still love it. I just don't go as much. The one in Willowbin? Yeah, well, it's true. There's more. There's two. Nearby, the original one's off of Frankfurt. Right? Yeah, Frankfurt I usually go to the Willowbin one. And Pie Tap. Pie you know, Tap, I feel yeah. like it, once a month we have a team activity that's, related to Pie Tap. That's where I first met you, actually. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, where else? Um, Velvet Taco. Velvet well, Taco. We had lunch today, yes. which is like my official cafeteria, I think. You like Velvet over tor- Torchies? I like different things at each one, mm. but because Velo Taco is so close to our office, they tend to go there a, a little bit more because I can just walk. But okay. I do like the margaritas and the queso at uh, Torchies. Oh, yeah. yeah. Best, I think one of the best quesos in town. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> we can have, we can have like a DFW queso map. Yeah. And, you know, I love barbecue. Oh, yeah. And I just um, I don't know that I have found my place in West Plano for barbecue. Besides the new H E B, I do kind of like that. I was about to say barbecue. That's a great spot. Yeah, I, I haven't. I I get I don't do a lot of grocery shopping because I'm a bachelor. <laughs> I don't do a lot of cooking, but I usually just go to Whole Foods again because it's by our office, yeah. and you know so I know where everything is. And so the times when I go to H E B, I'm impressed by the store, but I'm also like this is too much. I have to like relearn where things are. It's not worth it for me, except for the barbecue, because I can just walk right in and have barbecue. The barbecue and the prepared meal section is right next right, to each other. Yeah. So <laughs> it's you can really. really it's probably really designed need. with bachelors in mind. Yeah. <laughs> the prepared meals are great. Meals. I haven't had one yet. Yeah. Okay. You can get a chicken breast, green beans, a few potatoes, balanced meal for like seven bucks. That's a pretty good deal. I yeah. do think the value at HEB is definitely good. Oh, yeah. And I'm excited to see them expand like throughout the metro area. Yeah. They got their own yeah. Mexican brand foods really yeah huh it's amazing that it took them so long to come to <laughs> dallas because it's such a big market area that they've waited so long to come kind of make their move here priya went there yesterday said all the shelves were empty people were preparing for the storm <laughs> oh yeah so. so you know i always like to write things down you go constantly. with the list no 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 no, no like a notebook oh. and i have a brand i like <laughs> and so i can buy them at target i know right where they're at and I went to Target last night specifically because I was needed to get a new notebook. Yeah. And they didn't have them. The whole entire notebook shelf was out of stock. And I thought, this is kind of weird. Why are the notebooks out of stock? And then I'm on the app like to um, see if I can buy it at one of the other Targets. And they were all out of stock. And I was like, what's going oh on? Gosh, there must be like a Mead five-star notebook shortage. Like, It's not even back to I, school. And you can't order on Amazon except with ordering like a 15-pack. And Is there a shortage? Do I don't know. I don't know. Luckily, we have toilet paper back, though, so that's good. <laughs> we're out of notebooks, but we do have... Target right here on Park? Uh, I went to the one in Louisville. Oh. It's by Payway, which is another go-to spot for me. <laughs> Payway, uh, yeah. I Easy. Like, yeah. Easy, quick. Yeah. Same thing every time, so it's predictable. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about your career in real estate. Mm-hmm. We've talked a little about living in Dallas. A little bit about investing. What... Uh, uh, so thinking about living in North Texas, what would be some advice you have for a person who's thinking about moving here? Uh, the thing that my wife and I did was live in a few different places before we okay. s- settled down and bought a house. Yeah, so I you rented and got your yeah. feet, yeah, your, your bearings. And uh, I think that served us very well because yeah. you know, we know what neighborhoods we like and it's not all, they're all not all in the same areas. So mm-hmm. if we were to move... Specific specific areas we know the neighborhood, so it just yeah. you know kind of helped us in that. In that I think front. yeah, I think it's a good approach. And if somebody has the the time, I guess to keeping your advice, but like shortening the timeline, like maybe somebody who wants to make multiple trips and then like stay in those areas. Oh too, yeah, would absolutely. Be smart. I would say, and then really depending on like if you like to travel or you want to go to the city a lot, you know, just spend. It's very easy to drive around here. Yeah, we have a lot of roads. We have a lot of roads. Everywhere. We do. You gotta have so, a car here. You gotta have a car here, um, but it's easy to get around. So you know, if you are working somewhere or living somewhere far from your, say your workplace, then it's not that not as bad as it seems, 
or it would be in other cities. True. Like I, I've worked with a lot of Californians and their perception of bad traffic is different than mine. Cause I'll be like, Oh, that's really far away. And it's like 30 minutes. And they're like, no, I have to drive 30 minutes to get to the grocery store in traffic. Where, or an hour each way to work. So I think you're right, depending on I think your what tolerance. Makes, what makes Dallas unique is most people live within five minutes of a major thoroughfare. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, you think about how things are set up. There's just a lot of roads and they're easy to get to. I think Flower Mound is probably one of the only places that it's not no, no easy access to. That's interesting to think about. Yeah, you're not. But everywhere else, you're pretty much you know near yeah. 635, like 735. Capel or... Las Colinas, I mean, they got lots of roads there. Or we got over here in the north, like Plano, mm -hmm. Frisco. Yeah, right You're now. Set. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what would be some favorite, what neighborhoods you'd tell somebody to check out? Uh, I like West Plano. Okay. I have uh, San Bias. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's lots of great neighborhoods at uh -huh. various price points. True. Yeah, you're yeah. not locked into one price point in, in Plano. I think Las Colinas is a good spot because it's just convenient to get anywhere. Yeah. You're right in the middle of, the, of, you know, 15 minutes to Dallas, 15, 20 minutes to Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. uh, airport's right there. So, yeah, if you travel for work, it's yeah. great. 114, 121, you're, you know, you're at the intersection. You're there. All the major places. Yeah. I think I've spent a little bit of time in Las Colinas, and there are some neighborhoods I like. Like, we talked earlier about Hackberry Creek. I know Byron Nelson. Yeah. What other neighborhoods are over there that are worth uh, Windsor Ridge. Your screen? Okay, Cottonwood Valley. Cottonwood Valley. That's know that two, name. Uh, um, neighborhoods uh, right where the Four Seasons and you know Byron okay. Nelson used to be yeah. played out. So those are all good spots. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I, neighborhoods do you like up north here? Like when you think Plano, Frisco, Prosper. I like Willamette Estates, yeah. Glen Meadows. Yeah. Um, you know, there's the Normandy over there. That's my favorite neighborhood. Of yeah, but <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I mean it's. <laughs> There's a lot of really nice neighborhoods around here. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there you know you can go, you can go ten million, you can go a million, you can go five hundred thousand. Well, not right. anymore, but you know. previously you go five hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> and some people's dreams they'll be able to do five hundred thousand next year, but I think that's a dream that's for a buyers. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, cool. Um, what else do we do? We cover everything around investors. I know that's one of the big things you like talking about. Well, certainly that we talk about a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think if you're planning on investing, just think about you know what you want out of the investment. You know, what are your goals? What are your goals? Don't just invest to say, I invested. I'm, I invested in real estate. Yeah. But have some goals. Have some goals. Think about yeah. what's important. You know, long term, short term. How long you want to keep the investment? Per se. I think that's sage advice too, because. Some people just want to own an investment property, but like, why? Is it to tell your friends? Is it because you want appreciation? Is it because you got a lot of cash and don't know where to put it? A lot of folks don't know what it entails, right? Yeah. And especially if you're going to buy a rental property, are you going to manage it yourself? You know, what's involved there? Yeah, well, let's talk about that. Like, I think that's like could go a lot of ways. Like, yeah, you, you, you bought your first investment. Most people that work with me are buying buy and hold. Mm -hmm. I know you work with some people yep. that are like flippers. Let's say you bought a buy and hold investment. You can turn a rental property. Should you manage it yourself or should you hire somebody else? Uh, well, you can ask outsource. You can do like a hybrid model. You can outsource certain things and do certain things yourself. Um, you know, I would definitely leverage a realtor, uh -huh. find a tenant, manage yeah. the lease. Um, or you can hire a property management company to do that, right? They can do it from, from everything from leasing your leasing your home to uh, managing rent payments and managing the maintenance aspect of things and uh, or you can do it yourself what's it gonna cost you to hire a property manager though usually one month's rent so on the front end or like 10 one month's rent mm -hmm. for like finding the tenant finding the tenant managing uh, any maintenance requests and so that's not an ongoing thing they'll charge you every month mm -hmm. for okay you get a monthly charge you can pay it up front it really depends I um, think a lot of People are afraid, like, if I buy a rental property, am I going to be answering calls on Saturday night or during the Super Bowl and having to go fix a toilet? Uh, you could be. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, so yeah. you know, really, that's where having a good realtor could come in handy, right? To uh -huh. set, those set those expectations up with the, with the tenant itself, right? And yeah. kind of guide you through what that process looks like. And I guess there may be two that that's having the right terms in the lease if exactly. they call the plumber, not you. Yeah. Or like you said, a property management company who they're on call. 
Yeah, basically they're, they're gonna they're gonna invoice you. Something goes wrong. There's a maintenance request. They're just gonna send you a bill. So, but it's know. totally. I mean, you could be in China if you wanted. Totally only rental off. properties in Dallas and collecting a check. Yeah, totally hands off. I mean, you could do all these things yourself as well, yeah. but you have to take into consideration. You know, do you do you have maintenance people to go out to the property? Um, you know, do you have a list of vendors that you work with that you can utilize or leverage? You yeah, know, in case something does go wrong. Um, you know what you are responsible for to determine what you can. You know what the potential is going to be responsible for or what you're going to be responsible for. Uh, you can even hire or have a third party manage payments, right? Do it all online as yeah, well. Yeah, I like that. Instead of going knock on the door and collecting checks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of ways you can skin it. Yeah. What about a person? This is something I think would be really cool to set up, and perhaps one of my near term goals is like set up a syndicate for the person that has the capital that wants to be in real estate, but maybe doesn't have the time to manage it or the willingness. And, and then they can get a piece of a number of different deals, like to or either even bigger. Like I find multifamily to be fascinating. Yeah. Maybe because I do like, you know, buy and hold, like single family all the time. Yeah. Multifamily, I think, is fascinating because of the diversification. But I think that'd be an interesting yeah, project I mean, this year you know, to take a look at. People really don't know how to find an investment property, right? And so, yeah. and, well, that's why this whole industry exists with us. Right. And so. But, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe somebody doesn't have the hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a new home, mm-hmm. right? If that's what it's going to take. So yeah. the fractional investing is an opportunity for entry level investors to get into the game. Yeah, fractional right? investing. Mm-hmm. It's like fractional vacation yeah. home. Yeah, yeah, like a timeshare. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know, I want a ski condo so bad, but I may have to start with the fractional ski condo, yeah. especially since on a good year I ski like three weeks. <laughs> uh, yeah. What else did we miss in our? I know we chat all the time. Personally, what would you want to share with our audience when they're thinking about Texas or real estate? You know, there's just a lot of eating and drinking here in Texas. I mean, that's <laughs> it's a more that's a, a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So if you know if you're into that thing, that's uh, yeah. You got a lot of options here. There's overall good living here. I'd say <laughs> yeah. easy living. It's easy living. It's a residential city. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. When somebody when I first moved here, somebody says, "Here." This was like a decade ago now, but he says, "Here's how to think about Dallas." It's like the minivan of cities it's not super sexy but it's really practical it has everything you need absolutely and i was like that's an interesting way to think about it so you got other cities that are the sports cars and fancy but dallas is just just very practical we got our fancy people here too we do have that (laughs) you know what blows my mind just to go to legacy west and like even on like a thursday afternoon and you see all these like super expensive sports cars so a lot of lamborghinis where do these cars come from like they, I don't see them driving around, but Frisco. here they are. Frisco, that's where yeah. they come from. <laughs> they just come from Frisco. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today and your time. If our audience wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to connect? Call, text, email, social media, awesome. Instagram, we'll make Facebook. Sure, we'll make sure to put all that <laughs> below so they can connect. Have you been thinking about moving to North Texas? Maybe you're looking in Plano, Dallas, Frisco, or the surrounding communities. Each year, our team helps dozens of families make the move to Texas. We'd love to help you begin your journey. Learn more on our website at HastingsRE.com. That's H-A-I-S-T-I-N-G-S-R-E.com.